So, thank you for inviting me, first of all. Um, it's a pleasure. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to try and explain the Darwin incursion with two experiments looking for dark matter, uh, two very protected experiments, uh, which claim to have found dark matter, until recently claimed to have found dark matter. Um, but that's in tension with some other experiments that claim not to have found dark matter. So, what I'm going to try and do this talk is explain to you how both of those experiments, the signals they see, can actually be explained with other particles, more mundane particles, other than dark matter. Um, so, so this is the outline of the talk. I don't usually do this. Um, so I'm going to start with, with Dharma. Most of the talk will be about that. So um, introduce the Dharma detector, um, explain why it's looking for an annual modulation, why you might expect that from dark matter, and indeed why, why indeed Dharma has such a compelling result in terms of dark matter. Then I'll explain other sources of annual modulation, so in terms of muons and neutrinos specifically, and the neutrons that they produce. Uh, and then I'll show you how you can fit those to give you the right phase in Dharma, and explain how that can predict results of other experiments. Um, then I'll talk about cogent briefly, show you how to look for dark matter in cogent, and I'll explain what they actually see. So they claim to observe excessive events that looks like dark matter. I'll show you what it actually looks like. Um, yes, so just a, a brief introduction to direct detection. Here is a sketch which uh, I drew quite a long time ago. So here's a picture of the galaxy. And I've overlaid on top of it an example, a very, a very oversimplified example of the dark matter halo. Um, so from rotation curve data in the light, you, you propose the existence of a spherical halo of dark matter, the particles that surround the galactic disk um, and either rotate very slowly or don't rotate at all. Um, and these whiz around in their halo. And you can exploit the relative velocity between the Earth, which is inside this rotating disk, and the non-rotating halo uh, to look for dark matter. So you can see in this diagram here, you have the sun and the earth, and then the flow of dark matter coming towards the earth. So you're trying to exploit this relative velocity, very simple idea, dark matter coming in from this halo, uh, coming into the earth, and perhaps hitting a detector on earth, sure. This is simple, and that's a question, and I know this is cartoon-like, but um, does, the, does the dark matter halo usually extend beyond the luminous matter, or? Well, um, oh, you mean does it go further than I've drawn? Yeah, it does, yeah, definitely. But then you don't really know where the dominant halo ends. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's a pretty basic sketch. It's not even perfectly spherical, of course. Um, yeah, so again, basic idea, the dominant comes in, hits a stationary nucleus, uh, and then before and after, it recoils, giving the nucleus a small, a very small amount of energy, KEV level. So if you could look for this happening, you have an invisible particle which you never see. But if you suddenly see a nucleus recoil, then perhaps that was dark matter coming in from, from the galaxy and uh, initiating a recoil. So that is what dark matter direct detection experiments look for. They look for this very low energy uh, sort of spectral excess, this sort of thing. So very low energy is KEV scale. So light dark matter really gives you this, this low energy rise. So that's what you're looking for. Um, OK, so the basic situation at the moment is you have these experiments such as Dharma and Cogent, or the situation until very recently, uh, so Cogent is this sort of yellow blob, and Dharma, you can't really see it, but it's another shade of region where it's showed Dharma. So this is a plot of the cross-section of interaction of these dark matter particles against their mass. So the lines here, the ones labeled Lux and Super CDMX, those are experiments which claim not to observe any events consistent with dark matter. Um, so what that means is because they don't observe dark matter, they set an exclusion limit, which says that above this line, these parameters are ruled out. Um, so above the Lux line, for example, those cross-sections of masses uh, will give too many events in Lux, and since Lux doesn't observe events, um, that dark matter according to Lux doesn't exist. But events such as uh, experiments of Cogent and Dharma have regions, shaded regions. These are regions where they say, we have events consistent with dark matter. If dark, or if dark matter scatters elastically, very basic model, then it will give a cross-section of uh, about 10 to the minus 5 petabarns, and uh, a mass around 8 to 10 GV, so light dark matter. The Dharma and Cogent regions don't really overlap, but uh, they're quite close. Um, but the point is, at least under this sort of very basic WIMP scenario, the Lux and Super CDMS experiments rule out the Cogent and Dark regions. Uh, so I'll show you there's two things you can do. You can change the dark matter model, or you can explain these experiments without dark matter. So, so that's what we'll focus on this talk, is, is that. So we are motivated, because of this, this tension, this exclusion of Lux and Super CDMS, excluding these regions of Cogent and Dharma, we're going to try and explain Cogent and Dharma without dark matter. So we're saying they're excluded, they're not really dark matter, it was a mistake. Um, that's not necessarily the only solution, but it's one. Um, 
So, for example, here's a very basic sketch. Uh, this, is a, this is where Dharma sits under a, a giant mountain. Um, so the reason why it sits under a mountain is because, in principle, since dark matter doesn't really interact with anything, after you've gone through the entire mountain, the only thing left in the land or at the bottom of the mountain should be dark matter. Of course, that's, that's not true, but it's, uh, it at least reduces the backgrounds by many, many, many factors. So here's the Grand Sasso lab, that's where Dharma sits, under this huge, roughly 1.5 kilometer tall mountain. Uh, and there it is. So it's inside a lab, under a huge mountain. That's essentially what it's about. Sometimes they're in mines, um, but it's, it's the shielding you want. Uh, so this is, this is a, a sketch of the Dharma detector, which I took from one of Dharma's presentations. Uh, so it's around 250 kilograms of, of sodium iodide crystals. So these are crystals within layers and layers of shielding, like an onion. So not only do you have the mountain, you have all of this shielding. So the right in the middle, where you have the Dharma detector, all you should have left after all of the shielding is uh, dark matter, if your shielding is perfect, of course. So Dharma and all experiments search for nuclear recoil. So this is dark matter colliding with the nuclei, not with the electrons. So it's searching for nuclear recoils. But interestingly, Dharma itself cannot actually separate nuclear and electronic recoils. So although it's looking for nuclear recoils, uh, it, it actually also observes things scattering off electrons. It can't really disentangle the two, like some experiments like Lux. Uh, but this is the basic idea. So crystals which are very sensitive to these small energy deposits within shielding and shielding and more shielding. Something to note is that this is the Dharma detector here. It's surrounded by copper shielding, then a lot of lead shielding, and then um, polyethylene shielding. But the, the, the lead shield around it might become interesting. And of course, then there's rock all around the outside. Um, so here's one thing. It searches for something called an annual variation as event rate. So not only is it looking for scattering events, it's looking for the rates of scatters to change over the year. So it's not just looking for events, it's trying to look to see if the rate of these events varies over the year. And so why might that be interesting? Because it's a very specific signature of dark matter. The reason is fairly simple. So I showed you the sketch before where the dark matter is flushing towards Earth because we're rotating around the disk and there's a dark matter halo which doesn't rotate. But since the Earth orbits the Sun, this means that around June the 1st, um, the relative velocity is largest because the Earth is rushing towards the direction of dark matter. But six months later, on December the 1st, the relative velocity is smallest because the Earth is moving away from the dark matter. So what experiments like Dharma try to exploit is the fact that since the relative velocity will change slightly over the year, you might be able to see the event rate change over the year. So that's what it's looking for. Um, and indeed, the, you, can, you can predict this very well. So it's actually, if you assume a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution for the velocities, which is fairly well motivated, but not completely well motivated, you predict the phase very accurately. So you say it peaks in, a, in late May, early June. Um, it should give you a very obvious modulation with a period of a year. But very importantly is where it peaks. So you, you know the direction the dark matter should be coming from, because you know how the, how the disk rotates. So you know where the signal should peak. So if, if you look at your event rate in Dharma, and you see a signal which peaks in exactly the same place, well, that's uh, some call it a smoking gun signal. It's not really a smoking gun signal, but it looks very compelling. So let's take this signal, so this is entirely from prediction, predicted by theory, from just this effect, and compare it to what Dharma observed. So indeed, Dharma do observe an annual modulation over a very long time. It's actually two experiments, Dharma NAI and Dharma Libra, which is like a bigger, more precise version of Dharma NAI. But this is over uh, about 11 years. And on the bottom, I've shown a sort of zoom in of one of the regions. So the data points are the Dharma data, and the black line is it's not a fit. It is actually the prediction from dark matter. So the amplitude is fit. But the, uh, the phase and the period are fixed from prediction. And you can see, indeed, it does go through all the points very well. This actually is a very good fit. Uh, so this is pretty compelling, right? You see that the dark matter, uh, just by, from the prediction, actually does fit the data from Dharma really well. Uh, especially the phase, um, which, you know, wow, that's pretty impressive. Uh, unfortunately, though, as I told you before, um, at least in the most basic, um, yes, the phase is very close, however, the amplitude of the modulation requires a large cross-section, which in the basic sort of elastic scattering model is ruled out by Lux and super CMS. So you have two choices. You either modify the dark matter model, so you have dark matter broadly, which couples more with NAI, the NAI crystals, than with xenon or any of the other experiments that exclude them. Well, the second choice is you say, okay, well, the phase fits really well, but look, it doesn't, it, it isn't compatible with Lux and super CMS at all, so we're going to ditch dark matter, 
and find another source of our annual modulation which gives the correct period and phase. So in this talk, we'll focus on the second point. I, I think they're both, both valid points, but the second one hasn't received much attention recently. So let's focus on option two. What else can annually modulate? And can it really get the phase that dark, dark matter gave us? Because it was, the phase was really good. It was really close. So we're saying the phase works, but the amplitude doesn't really work, at least in the most basic model. <laughs> So what if we look at other enemy modulating signals? Uh, which is what we're going to do. So the main focus, as I say, is the phase and the rate. So the phase. The, the Dharma data is very close to the phase of from dark matter. Can we reproduce that? Or is it really a smoking gun signal? The second point is the rate. Do we know the rates of the other enemy modulated sources? Can they be large enough to give you the rate of Dharma, which is actually about 100 events per day, which is, which is huge. And that's why the cross-section was so big for dark matter. You need actually a very large event rate. Um, so can we do this? Can we get the phase? And can we find a source which actually gives you enough events? Let's find out. Um, so before I go on, what else will give you events in something like uh, Dharma? So I told you it's behind a mountain, all this stuff. Uh, so you, you know, there's all this shielding. Surely nothing else can get in. But there are things that can get in, mostly from, from radioactive decay. That will give you, obviously, a constant event rate. But there are things, you, you, can, you can't stop radioactive isotopes in the shielding from giving you events. Um, but the most dangerous thing is neutrons, because they also give you nuclear recalls that look quite similar to the nuclear recalls you'd expect from dark matter. So again, they can come from alpha decay and so forth. There's decay in the shielding, but again, decay is a constant thing, so it wouldn't give you any modulation. But that's the sort of events that you get. These are the sort of backgrounds, mostly radioactive decay, or cosmogenic isotopes, which I'll explain to you now. Um, so a promising candidate on the, along that similar line is, is something called muon-induced neutrons. So this has been studied quite a lot. This wasn't, this wasn't my idea. Um, so the idea is you have a neutron, uh, sorry, not a neutron, a muon coming in and hitting a nucleus somewhere in the Dharma shielding or somewhere in the rock surrounding Dharma. So not in Dharma itself, somewhere in the material surrounding Dharma. A muon comes in from the atmosphere and it hits uh, a nucleus somewhere around Dharma to produce a neutron. So it knocks a neutron off the nucleus. These are quite high-energy muons. Uh, not many of them actually survive from the atmosphere, but there are still maybe enough to give you enough uh, events. They come all through the mountain, and they produce these neutrons in the rock or shielding around them. Um, so these neutrons, perhaps they're the signal in Dharma. Um, perhaps these neutrons from these muons are actually the signal, not dark matter. Um, it's actually a very complicated process. One neutron can produce many neutrons. Um, one, neutron, one muon can produce many neutrons. And it's not actually as obvious as just saying a muon hits a nucleus to produce a neutron. You could have a muon emit photons, which release neutrons, or a muon hits a nucleus, which hits another nucleus, which releases neutrons, and so forth. So there's sort of, it's very nonlinear. Um, so the point of this is just to show you that it's actually quite complicated. Um, but anyway, so muons producing neutrons. Could that be the signal ends up? Um, so this is a basic sketch of the, of the idea you have. Uh, Cosmic ray pion and kaons in the upper atmosphere, so very high up in the stratosphere. Cosmic rays come in. Uh, so, for example, pions. These pions might decay, they can decay, and they could decay to muons. If a pion decays to a muon, the muon could get all the way through the mountain and to Grand Sasso Lab. Of course, most of the muons don't, but some of them do. So the idea is you have these pions in the upper atmosphere, they decay, and they produce muons. Um, so this is where the muons come from. The muons then travel all the way to the lab, where they um, hit some sort of material around the detector to produce loads of neutrons, which create your events. So the muons come in, they come from cosmic decays, they hit uh, stuff in the target, and they produce neutrons, and these neutrons are your events. So that's the idea of muon induced neutrons. OK, so that produces events, but why would they add any modulate? So you need something not only that gives you events, but as I said, gives you a period and a phase consistent with the observation of dark. Um, so actually, they do have any modulators. They are, they are actually, the muon flux is correlated with the temperature of the atmosphere above Grand Saturn. The reason is because in the winter, the atmosphere is more dense. The pions interact more with the, with the air, um, which means actually they produce, they decay less often. So in the winter, pions decay less often and produce fewer neutrons. So, in fact, the muon flux is, is very tightly correlated to the temperature of the atmosphere of our Grand Saturn. So you have, and indeed this has been measured by Borisino, so loads of experiments actually do see the muon flux vary up and down, and it's completely correlated to the temperature. Or, sure. 
Dama cannot reconstruct the direction of the recoil. No, no, unfortunately not. Um, there are experiments which are trying to reconstruct direction, and if you could, that yeah. would be a very good test. Um, yeah, it would be perfect, but unfortunately, Dama can't. So the muon flux is, is correlated to the temperature above ground surface. So again, we have a prediction for the phase. As I said, phase very important. The dark matter phase fit almost perfectly to the Dharma data. Does the muon phase fit well to the Dharma data? Uh, so unfortunately, no. Um, so you, you, you can sort of see it here. In fact, it becomes more significant when you analyze the whole data. But this is just to give you an idea. You have another modulated signal. Can this explain Dharma? Not easily, no. The muon flux actually peaks 30 days after the Dharma data. So that doesn't look like much, but you have 11 annual cycles, so it ends up adding up. So, for example, here you can really see it as it goes, it goes up and it sort of gets down there. And it gets, so you can see it's actually it's just after it. Every time it's just after it. Um, so this, again, this wasn't me. But it's, so this is a great idea. People want muons, neutrons from muons. That really could be Dharma. But it, it can't because it peaks 30 days too late. So close, but so far. Um, so that's to give you an idea. You can see it's 30 days too late. Um, but of course, people have done something a bit more rigorous. Uh, here you can see, I took this from this paper here, the Grand Sasso muon puzzle. Uh, they show the phase here on this axis versus the period. So they, they nicely have a period of a year, or at least a consistent with the period of a year. So this here is Dharma. Dharma has lower statistics than the muon experiments. So you can see it has a very wide range of phases available. But unfortunately, the muons are very well measured, and they have a phase which is about 30 days too late. So um, you can see that the muons are 30 days behind Dharma. And actually, it's 5.2 sigma incompatible. So it's not muons. It's not muons alone. The phase is too late. How many years of data is there, are the muons? I think they're about 17 years of okay. data. The, the, the people in this paper took a combination of lots of experiments, like macro, LVT, uh -huh. Boris, you know. Um, so the muons are actually very well measured. Of course, also, the muons is an experiment designed to maximize the muon rate, so they get loads of events, whereas mm -hmm. in some sense, if Dharma were seeing muons, it's trying to stop muons, so it's in some sense reducing the statistics. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so the muons are very well measured. So that's why there's a discrepancy. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, all, all these experiments with muons are on the surface, right? I mean, no, some of them are even in Grand Sasso. Yeah, okay. Boric yeah, for example, yeah. it's always next to Dharma. Um, so, yeah, so the disagreement. So you mean also the rest of the experiments are next to Dharma? Not all of them, no. Okay. no. So, I mean, so uh, in the paper, I, I just use Boric because it's Time. But yeah, there are lots of experiments, some of which are, some of which aren't. Um, yeah. So, muons disagree that the phase is too late. Uh, so where do we go from here? We have a signal which almost, almost was there, but wasn't quite. Um, are there any other annually modulated effects? Yes, there is potentially one more. There are, well, there are potentially loads more, but this is one which is quite different to the muons. Solar neutrinos. So again, you have the same idea. The solar neutrinos don't give you the events directly. They hit atoms, nuclei, in the targets or the shielding or something around Dharma, which we can discuss later, something around Dharma, which releases neutrons. So the neutrinos, again, they come in, they hit a nucleus, they release a neutron, and that neutron gives you an event in Dharma. Okay, so solar neutrinos. This is another annually modulating source, which gives you more neutrons. So there's two questions we have to ask. Does it give you enough neutrons? And what phase does it produce the signal with? So it gives you an annual modulated signal, which I'll explain where that comes from. But are there enough neutrons? And what is the phase? So uh, before I go into that, the kinematics. So for example, with lead, so I remember telling you, that maybe I told you there was a lead shielding around armor, so maybe they hit atoms of lead to release neutrons. So lead, for example, has a a neutron breakup threshold of 2.3 MeV. So you need to bring in two, sorry, two, 7.3 MeV. You need to bring in that amount of energy in order to knock off a neutron. It's almost like the binding energy per nuclear. So you need to bring in that energy to knock off a neutron. So that's, that means that the, the really high flux solar neutrinos can't do it. Um, the ones that do it are the B8 neutrinos. So B8 neutrinos have energies up to 14 MeV. So in principle, in principle, a B8 neutrino can knock off a neutron from something like lead. Things like iron and copper have very similar thresholds. Light relevance have lower thresholds in general, but not always. So, John, the just maybe you raised it before, but just for everybody, in case they this is this is the spectra that you expect from solar neutrinos from the different reactions of mm. the sun, right? And this, of course. as you were correctly explaining, only few of them can actually have sufficient energy to. Yeah. 
Yeah, sure. In the example materials, those are materials in the shielding? Is that what you're saying? So lead, for example, is a very prominent material in the shielding of Darwin, very close to Darwin. The reason why I picked lead is because it's been proposed, proposed in the past with the muons as something, a very good target. Um, it's very dense, so, it has, so it's very good at producing neutrons. The cross-section to produce neutrons from things like neutrinos and muons in lead is also very high, because it scales as A or A squared. Um, yeah, so this is the spectrum you expect the neutrinos, indeed measure of neutrinos from the sun. So at low energies you see that there's a huge flux of PP neutrinos. So these come from the most basic fusion process in the sun's core that produces heat. But it can't be those because they have very low energy. In principle, that's the huge flux. And then you get, as you go higher energies, you get lower and lower fluxes. These are more complicated processes that take, take place in the sun, all the way up to B8 and the H and P chain, and maybe even beyond. So every time producing heavier and heavier elements, and fewer neutrinos, but at higher energy. So we're really looking at the sort of tail ends, the lower flux, but higher energy neutrinos coming from heavier for the sun elements. Um, so a rough estimate of cross sections, this is very rough. Uh, and the next step in this, in this sort of thing, the next step that I will be checking is fluxes, really fluxes and event rates. But let's start with a sort of very basic idea of oh, well, even, even roughly, are there enough events? So, for example, bore and solar neutrinos, the flux is about 10 to the 6 centimeters squared per second. It's actually a huge flux. The flux of even B8 solar neutrinos is very large. But the cross section of interaction, so for example, the cross section uh, for a solar neutrino to knock off a neutron uh, from something like lead is weak scale, so 10 to the minus 41 centimeters squared. So, a huge flux, tiny cross section um, to produce neutrons. Is this centimeters to the minus 2? Or? Uh, yes, it is. Very good observation. It should be per second being squared per second for the flux. Um, again, for that one, so it should be per second squared, of course. For the muons, you see that the flux is much lower. So the muon flux is, is tiny compared to the neutrino flux because the muons have had to get through the mountain. Uh, the neutrinos don't really care about the mountain above Grand Sasso, but the muons do. So they've really been attenuated by traveling through this mountain to get to the Grand Sasso lab. But their flux is, sorry, their cross section is much larger. So the neutrinos have a huge flux and a tiny cross-section, the muons have a tiny flux and a huge cross-section. Uh, so what you want to see is can you get, what are the rates, comparable rates, would you expect similar rates of muon neutrons and neutrino neutrons? Um, well, so if you assume they scatter off the same targets, the answer is yes, the rates are similar. That is a big assumption if they scatter off the same targets. It's probably not true. And that's something I'm looking into next, is, is what targets they really scatter off. So, at this point, in this approximation, you assume that you have the same target, the rock overburden, the lead shield around Dharma. You assume it's the same target for muons and neutrinos. They both hit these targets, both produce neutrons, and you're looking to see if the rates of those neutrons are comparable, just by looking at the cross-sections and fluxes. It's a very basic order of magnitude. John, I have a question. Sure. Um, all this 1.5 kilometers we get from the surface of the, of the Earth to, to, uh, to the, the detector and the shielding, Okay, it might not be lead, but, but still uh, there's, a, there's a solid uh, stuff, uh, and, 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 and the density is not much different actually from the density of the shielding. I mean, uh, maybe it's like 20-30% uh, less dense, but still there's a lot of material there. It's true. So, so given the cross-section, I mean, you would expect that you will get like, in some sense, like a uniform distribution of the interaction, mm. you know, and that this produced neutrons, okay? They're going to be produced all over the, 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 the path from the surface. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. True. So in principle, if, yeah, in principle, you're producing neutrons all the way as you go down the mountain. But you're also factoring the fact that the neutrons you produce at the top of the mountain practically will never get to dark. Exactly. Mm -hmm. so, so, you, so you have to take into account the fact that, that all the ones that produce like very far away, they don't have enough uh, energy. Yeah. And the means of that is sorted actually to reach the detector. Yeah, there's no way that neutrons at the top of the mountain would ever get to dark. Exactly. So the flux I use of the muons is the one measured at Grand Sasso. Okay, so that was my next question. Yeah. This flux is the one measured the measure at Grand Sasso or at the top of the mountain? At Grand Sasso. Yeah, so this, okay, so this is already, already, already the ones at the detector. Really. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So the muon flux also, of course, at the top of the mountain will be considerably higher. Right, right. And it's got through the whole thing. But then I'll answer your question. You don't really care about it. Since they measure inside the inside the. Yeah, but, but if you want actually to, to figure out, like, uh, if you want to compare rates, right? Sure. Because, we have, because mm -hmm. the question is like to compare, like, uh, what is the flux, let's say, of dark matter, if dark matter is due to dark matter, okay? Compared to what is the flux of 
of, like of, of neutrons uh, hitting the detector. And, and you need to know the flux that, that Jonathan presents here, okay, how many of them, how many neutrons are produced in the sun and get there. But also you have to know like how many of them you lose on the way because because uh, sorry but, uh, <coughs> so the immune flux has been measured mm. at detector. So in terms of the neurons, those are the neurons. And again. what are the neutrinos? The neutrinos again are the flux. That's the flux by measured by Boris Seeger again. So it's okay. So but then but then from that point of view they're already there. I mean you don't have to worry about. It. I mean the neutrino flux doesn't really change because it's mm -hmm. the neutrinos. The neuron flux of course does attenuate. But the question of course is also the neutrons that you produce will they get to the detector? Yeah. So I have actually a rough mm -hmm. estimate in the, the new version of the paper. Looking at the mean free path and looking at actually. So it should be like a few meters, right? A few meters, yeah. yeah. So a few meters linearly, so a volume of roughly, of roughly 500 meters cubed for the muon neutrons. Um, the neutrinos actually, I think, is a lot more subtle. So that the neutrons from muons are quite high energy. I'm pretty sure they could come from quite a large volume and still get to Dharma. The neutrons from neutrinos, not so obvious. And I think to say they scatter off the same volume is probably oversimplistic. Um, so that's really the next step is to work out really. I think it's more subtle than neutrons going to neutrinos. Um, if you, but if, again, if you were to assume the same scattering volume, you get a rate of neutrino, neutrons from neutrinos which isn't actually maybe as small as you might expect. So everything to do with neutrinos you usually assume is tiny. But in fact, uh, with the same scattering volume, the muon rate is only 10 times larger. So roughly, if roughly the muon, the rate of muon induced neutrons is roughly 10 times larger than that from neutrinos. Maybe five times, but it's order of magnitude same time. So you're expecting a larger rate of neutrons from muons, but not super large at Grand Sasso. So you have a subdominant neutrino induced neutron convert and a larger muon induced neutron convert. Um, so the question is why do the neutrinos modulate? So why would we expect a rate of neutrinos which goes up and down over the year? The answer is simple it's due to the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit. So you can see here that. Uh, the neutrino flux is largest when the Earth is closest to the Sun, which is around the 3rd of January. And the neutrino flux is smallest six months later when the Earth is farthest away from the Sun. Whereas the muon flux is largest on the 21st of June when the, Earth is, when the northern hemisphere is warmest. So they really peak at different points. The neutrinos modulate because the distance modulate, the distance changes, the muons change because of the temperature. Uh, and Dharma peaks about there. So you can already see the idea that, that's developing is perhaps if you could combine the two signals, you could uh, dial your phase somewhere in between. Is there, is there also like a wind effect for the muons mm. uh, due to the fact that, I mean, the Earth is, is still moving with respect to the sort of like a, in a background of the, of the muons, right? Yeah, that's quite I think there are actually, I should say that... Apart from the temperature effect that you mentioned. There I mean, are a lot so of other effects. Should it be also an effect like that? I mean, mm. exactly at the same time. Yeah, there are lots of higher effects. So event like that will be interesting, actually. I think to say that muons only modulate as a sinusoid over a period of one year is complete oversimplification. and something I'll get to later. There are loads of higher modes of the muon rate. So there's an 11-year phase, 11-year period, sorry, which I'll mention. But there are also, I think, two-year periods and three-year periods and other higher order effects. So to say that the muons are a sinusoid over a period, the phase that peaks around 21, 20 of June is an oversimplification. Um, and you can actually use that to test this hypothesis, which I'll show later. So the muons have loads of higher order modes. The neutrinos don't really, though, which is quite interesting. But the, the muons have loads of extra stuff. So an experiment in the southern hemisphere would not see this for It would see a completely different effect. Yeah. So that could not be an explanation for an experiment uh, in Brazil. Yeah, you, uh, I'd love an experiment in Brazil, or an experiment in Antarctica, like DM ice, which I'll, I'll mention later. Another experiment, seeing a signal, would completely test this model. If you had a second observation of a modulation, with a good modulation with a well in phase, that would completely fix it. You could tell if it was dark matter or this. If the phases were the same, it's probably dark matter. Any other phase. It's and there's not a second experiment? You said you need to start no other experiment that claims to observe a modulation to nine sigma. No. There's no other experiment. The only experiment that claims to see a modulation apart from Dharma might be cogent, but that's only a two sigma. The phase of cogent is all over the place. All over the place. Yeah. So so what we need is another Dharma. We need another nine sigma signal. Yeah, possibly in the south, right? Exactly. And perfectly in something like DMI in Antarctica. That would be perfect. Because the phase under this would be completely different. This is not a very expensive experiment. Yeah, but I'd love if they built one, actually. Right? <laughs> yeah. It would be great if they were built one. Yeah. It would completely test it, you're right. Um, and that's actually something which I'll come to later. It's really predictions for other experiments. Because that's this is just one thing. Sure, it fits. But you need another experiment to really test it. Um, 
So anyway, the neutrinos, they modulate because the distance between the, the Earth and the Sun changes over the year. And this isn't just theory, uh, it's been measured. So for example, Super Kamikande, also Boroxino, have measured uh, this modulation, period of uh, about a year, um, and a phase of about uh, four days from the beginning of the year. It's actually about 11 plus or minus four, as measured by Boroxino, but it's, it's, it's at the beginning of the year. So the neutrino flux, you can see here that what I was saying before, this is the flux r over 4 pi r squared. The r is a function of time because it's, there's an eccentric orbit. So it has this cos here. And phi nu is the phase of the neutrinos. So you have the neutrinos, they modulate annually, but they have a phase that peaks right at the beginning of the year. So the muons, they peak around, around where the northern hemisphere is hottest. The neutrinos peak around the 4th, around the 4th of January, maybe the 10th of January, but they peak very early. So the basic idea is this. We have neutrons from, neut from muons, they modulate, but they have a phase 30 days too late. You have neutrons from neutrinos. The rate can plausibly be only slightly smaller than the one from muons, but they have a phase about five months earlier than Dharma. So you have muons which are too late, neutrinos which are far too early. They both produce neutrons, which makes up the Dharma signal. But can the combination, can all these neutrons together can that fit the Dharma data? Uh, the answer, of course, because you have three parameters, is yes. So you have two signals with fixed phases. So there are two free parameters. Um, you have two signals. The muon one is shown as the blue dashed line. That phase is fixed from experiments. The neutrino signal, again, the phase is fixed from other experiments. Both experiments are Grand Sasso. Um, that phase is also fixed. But what you don't know, at least for now, you don't know their exact amplitude. So if you leave the amplitude of the two signals as three parameters, yes, you can get an almost perfect fit. So the idea is you have two signals which interfere, so neutrinos that produce neutrons, muons that produce neutrons, the combined neutron signal is a product of interference, but they don't interfere completely, so you get this leftover signal as the solid line, which fits the Dharma data. So two signals both individually have the wrong phase, four days, 179 days, but together give you a signal that works. Um, so the idea is the neutrino-induced neutrons have a smaller, smaller contribution. You wouldn't really notice them at an integrated rate. But they manifest as a phase shift. So although their rate is probably smaller, they, they actually come in as a phase shift. So what I'm trying to argue here is that phase perhaps is, isn't as big a deal as you might expect. You can actually get a phase to fit out of two signals, both of which individually have the wrong phase. Um, and indeed you can. You can get a shift. So the neutrino signal can pull the muon signal forward to some extent. Um, of course this is a fit, so I fit the amplitudes. But that, so what that does is it constrains the predictions of other experiments. So although I can, I, I'm allowed to do this one fit, um, I'm not allowed to fit again. So you really, another signal would completely constrain the model. Um, and then you, so you could also, if you allow the phases to fit within their measured ranges with the error bars, um, you can see there's actually a fairly wide range of, of parameters that, that fit. So the best fit is when you have the neutrino amplitude at about 70% of the muon amplitude, which is quite high, but it can go down to about 50%. Um, and you can see the reason why 70% uh, fits so well is that's where the, the peak day, so where the signal is largest, is closest to dark. So the point is you have two phases which interfere, but not quite perfectly, and that gives you a phase which fits very well to dark data. You have a fairly large range of free parameters to fit. Um, you fit the two amplitudes, but you fix the phases. Sorry, sure. you said that the ratio of the, of the, of the um, range is about no, one to one. So yeah. And the muon is 10 times more than... Uh, yeah, roughly. Would you expect also the amplitude to be proportional to the range? Well, I think to some extent. So this amplitude does seem a bit high. It's not right. quite true, because um, what you're actually thinking, of course, is the modulation amplitude. Right. So if the muons... So if, more, if the muons have a larger modulation amplitude than the, sorry, the neutrinos have a larger amplitude than the muons, it's not quite true. So the, the amplitude is how much just the muon signal or just the neutrino signal it own modulates. So for example, the neutrinos have a modulation amplitude on their own of about 3.5%, which means that um, not the whole range, you, you never see zero neutrinos one time and all the neutrinos another time. It only ever wobbles up and down by about 3%. So it's not completely total. Uh, in the sun, you have also oscillations between like the electron and muon neutrinos, right? I mean, inside uh, the sun. Inside the sun, yeah. yeah. So the MSW effect. Exactly. So 
one, I mean, since you change the, actually the distance mm. during the year, right? Mm. Wouldn't this, uh, the oscillation wouldn't affect also uh, this modulation also? I mean, well, I did look into <laughs> So I, I think if it's neutral, neutral scattering, I don't think it really does. Because you don't really care about the Yeah, for neutral, yes, because, because then it's flavor of flavor line, line, right? Yeah. Okay. But yes, that's true. So I, I think there is an effect observed where you see the flavors, the flavors change. Over the year. Because you'd also, in principle, like to look for a diurnal modulation. So over every day, because you change, even over a day, you change the amount right, of exactly. yeah, yeah, which yeah, is the exactly. MW effect. Yes. Um, I think the statistics isn't really good enough to look for that. <laughs> but yeah, so flavor ratios you would expect to change. Um, I don't know how how could. This but I mean, have you estimated, like, for example, what is the uh, uh, the neutral uh, cross section with respect to the the one that involves like Ws? I mean, mm. no, I haven't actually. I could. Okay. Interesting. Because I, I would imagine that it's of the same order of magnitude, yeah. right? I mean, and then you might observe a flavor yeah. effect for that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think yeah, so that's the idea. So you have two rates. So there's a question again: Do you actually get enough neutrons? So you know, you can show that you can fit the phase. The phase, it fits very well. But fundamentally, are there enough neutrons to give you all the events that Dharma observed? Because not only does Dharma give you this annual modulation, they actually get like 100 events a day, which is huge. Um, so the idea is, to, to, get that, to get that very large count rate, you need a huge, well not huge, but a large scattering volume. So the idea is you have <coughs> shielding and rock around Dharma. The neutrinos and muons hit the shielding or the rock around Dharma and produce neutrons. The larger the volume of target you have, the more neutrons you could produce. Of course, it's not that simple because neutrons very far away won't get there. But if you, if you estimate it, so you know the cross-section and flux, so you estimate you need about 1,000 meters cubed of target to give you 100 counts per day. That's very rough, very rough, very order of magnitude. 1,000 meters cubed isn't crazy. That's about a sphere of a radius of about 3 meters. So it's, it's, not, it's not completely crazy huge. I thought if I found a number that was, was massive, I would, I would stop, but it's, it's okay, so it's, it remains to be seen if that's actually realistic. That's really the next step of the project, is to work out, is that realistic? Can you actually get scattering with such a large volume? So you can imagine, you know, a 10 by 10 by 10 meter cube of rock, maybe not so crazy, um, but it remains to be seen if that's actually realistic. So if you have a volume of that size, of target to produce neutrons, then yes, you can get 100 counts per day. Um, so it seems reasonable, but there is a caveat, this is an estimate. And I need to do the Monte Carlos and so forth to really get this. So at the moment I've shown it can work, but I need to do this to show it definitely does work. Um, yeah, so one, one other thing as well is that the, they might come from different places. Well, I'll show that later. Anyway, so um, just to show it here, these are the, the free fits that you can compare. So this is showing the, the neutrino plus muon model, so the interfering model, is the solid cyan line, all, inter, all overlaid over Dharma data. So you can see that the combined model, the neutrons from neutrinos and muons, that fits really well. It gets the phase very well. Dark matter is a bit fainter, but it's the, it's the, the dashed black line. Again, that also gets the phase very well. And the muons, as we showed earlier, are you know, indeed 30 days too late. But what you can see, indeed, is that the combined model fits very well. Almost as well, actually better than dark matter does. Although it's like, and if you work out the simple, simple chi-squares, you can see that the neutrinos plus muon model has the lowest chi-square, but not, not by much. I mean, Dark matter and neutrinos plus muons fit pretty much as well, but you can see, as expected, the muons on their own fit really badly. And again, it's just because of the phase. So the neutrinos plus muons does give you a fit to Dharma data. It does actually work. Um, and if the rates turn out to be large enough, then I think this would explain it. Um, so it can work. The idea is you have neutrinos drag the phase of the combined signal forward to a point where, indeed, it is overlaid over the Dharma data. Um, so, okay, fine. But what else can you look for? So, so one signal which will really stick out is 11-year mode. So, so this is the combined muon data from lots of different experiments taken from, from this reference. Uh, they show that this is over a very long time, so from 1991 to 2010. You can see that although there's an annual mode, as I mentioned, there is quite a prominent higher order mode over about 11 years. So you can see that not only does the thing wobble, it has like a sort of beat wave. So you can see that the, the whole thing modulates over about 11 years. So there's something you can look for. The muons modulate not just every year, but also over this 11-year cycle, which is correlated with the sun's magnetic field. So if you could see an 11-year cycle in the Dharma data, that would be a sort of a sure sign that you're seeing something coming from muons and not from dark matter. 
Um, so there's a muon component in the muon plus neutrino model. So you would expect it. You would so, expect so it. So these, these muons you assume that are produced where in the atmosphere or? Yeah, so they come from pion and decay on decay in the atmosphere. Yeah. So it's the okay. pion so, so you're saying that the, the, the magnetic field of the sun affects uh, muons that are the... Uh, it actually affects the, the cosmic rays that produce the muons. So it affects the okay, pion and decay. Okay. How yeah. about if they are produced, I mean, if this is like muon neutrinos, for example, I mean, that... that uh, so muon neutrinos from the atmosphere, that they would, they would also much like this. The solar ones would. So, so you would also have atmospheric muons, which would show you this. Um, but not solar neutrinos. They don't have any of this. So, so you're saying that if you're right, then this is a third modulation, which mm. is at your period of 11 years. Exactly. On top of everything. Exactly. And that's what Dama should also show after a while. Now it's not really been shown for so many years. Yeah. But if they go over 22 years, they should ski. And so it imposes the overall. Yeah, it's this effect. This is like it's a 1% effect. 1%. Percent yeah, so effect. You, can't, you can't see it now. Okay. So, so this is the thing you see from. I'll show you what you can see in Dama data. So, so this, is, this is the sunspot activity. So indeed, the sunspot activity does vary over 11 years. Um, so, uh, why don't we try comparing this to Dama data? So actually, Dharma now, fairly recently, do give you the annual averages. So this is the average rate um, on each year. So the data I showed you before, they actually subtract this from the data. So they sort of almost flatten their data. But this is the, this is the average of the event rate every year uh, for different energy bins, the lowest energy bins to the highest energy bin. Um, what you'd like to look for in here is precisely this 11-year mode. Unfortunately, it's quite difficult for them because you have, in principle, two experiments. You have Dharma NAI and Dharma Libra over about a 13 year period. Um, and of course, the, the beginning has huge error bars. So you're looking for a 1% effect when these error bars are about 2% in size. So it's quite difficult. Um, but in principle, if Dharma Libra, for example, got six more years of data, you might hope to see a 1% modulation in the annual averages. It's not particularly easy. You yeah, so, I mean, the, the uh, Dharma doesn't say anything more than uh, something like. Uh, Few kV, right? I and mean, it's just zero after that. Yeah. So, but but if muons actually are coming from cosmic rays, you would expect that some of them would be very energetic. So, mm -hmm. so you there would be some events that, that they will actually give you, like you know that that you will not have this cancellation, right? Because you will have very energetic muons that cannot be sort of like cancelled by 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 the solar one because the solar the, sol the energy of the solar neutrinos is fixed, right? I mean, it's eight whatever. 14 MeV that you mentioned above and on. So the, the, the neutrons do, I mean, the calculations of the muon energy neutrons are much much more robust. So they're shown to have a spectrum which rises at low energies. So you expect a lot more neutrons from muons, even though the muons have GV energies. You actually expect a lot more of them at about 2 to 6 kV. So although you would get those events, you probably wouldn't see them above all the other stuff. But they would be there, yeah. So if you could find those events, yes, that's true, they would have the muon force. Depends um, also the way they put this. Uh, It would be nicer to know actually which events they reject. Yeah. Huh? It would be nice to have more data. Yeah, because apparently now they don't tell you what they had to do the way. But yes, yeah, so you could try and look for this, but unfortunately maybe not at the moment. But again, a new experiment uh, could try and look for an 11 year mode. Of course, it requires 11 years of data, so it's not the best one. Um, there are other things. So Dharma uh, have an, an energy dependent phase, yeah. uh, which is quite interesting. So they have. So what I showed you there was the energy bin 2 to 6 kV, so the largest energy bin. Mm -hmm. They give you three sets of events. They give you two to four, two to five, and two to six, which is what they show you. Uh, so I'll highlight the columns I'm interested in. So they show you the phase for each of these energy bins. So the lowest one, the lowest row, is what I've been showing you all along, the one peaks at one, four, six days. And actually, not so much significance, but you can see that the phase does shift forward. So if you go to lower energies, and they, you know, they, they say this in all their presentations, if you go to lower energies, the phase of the signal moves forward, not very significantly, but it does move forward. So, and, I mean, that's, it's not a big deal because they don't measure the phase very well, but it's still interesting. If, if really that was a real effect, the fit of dark matter to Dharma maybe isn't such a miracle after all. So I, I showed you for the 2 to 6 kV bin, the Dharma phase fit very well to the data. But for the 2 to 4 kV bin, the phase is 10 days early. So suddenly it's not looking quite so miraculous. The phase shifting forward of energy is a bit of a weird thing. Okay, so you can get that in dark matter model. Um, for dark matter to work, for this to work, you need uh, a stream. So you can get about a one-day shift, an energy-dependent shift, which is normal distributions, but you need a sort of a stream of dark matter. So that's on top of the sort of halo you have. You have, for some reason, there's 
uh, like a river of dark matter flowing through the solar system. Uh, so if that or were if the you have rotation actually of the halo, right? Sorry, if you have like rotation of the halo, I mean. Uh... Mm. Yeah, well, I don't think the rotation of the halo will give you an energy dependent phase. So it would change things. Um, but again, the halo does rotate at about ten kilometers per second, probably. I don't, think it gives, I don't think it would give you a phase this dramatic. So if you really did see a 10-day phase shift with energy, you know, only going so sorry, a few but kilometers. Sure. I understand that this is a crisp plane with that map. But you say, is it easy, is it, is it easy to crisp plane with the with, with interference? Maybe. 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 I, I think, think, it's it's think it is possible, actually. No, no, I'm trying to understand more of the statement. The statement is that if you hmm. have different energies you seem to have a, from the data, is it a pattern within a C? It's, it's not assume that's not, I mean, assume that it's significant. I think it's something to look but for. If it is, yeah, no, I'm trying to say, if it is significant, then you would say that it would be hard to explain with the simplistic model of that map. Yeah. Because, but what I don't, I don't get is that, would that hint more to your model? Or not necessarily. Not no. necessarily. Okay, I wasn't, I wasn't clear to me. No, I don't, I don't think necessarily. Okay. I mean, at the moment, I don't know. Okay. It is, it is again, possible within the model. Uh, but. You know, is it any more compelling than dark matter? I mean, because you can invent a stream, so a stream would explain it. So if you had a stream, it does work. Um, but yeah, so in, in, in my model, for example, if you had the neutrino spectrum uh, rise more steeply at low energies, then you would expect a phase shift. Because uh, at low energies, more of, the, more of the neutrinos are getting in, so it shifts more towards the neutrino phase. In principle, uh, this is something I touched on before, the scattering volume is different for neutrinos, because you could have a neutrino get right close to the diamond detector, which I've shown in orange, and produce a neutron, and the neutrino just flies off because you can't detect neutrinos. If, if a muon did this, it, you wouldn't get away with it because the muon will be tagged. So neutrinos can get right close to the diamond detector, produce a neutron, and the neutrino escapes. The muon can't do this. Um, so there are, in principle, other effects which discriminate between neutrinos and muons. But it's true to say that it may not be any easier to do in this model than it is for dark matter. Uh, but it's something to look for again. Uh, one, one, one other thing, uh, you can also look for how the phase changes with depth of that of lamp. So, um, as, as you saw, the, the fact that the, you got the Dharma phase depended very much on the cancellation between the neutrino and the muon bits. Um, what this means, though, is that since the muon flux is different at different labs, because the depth of the, the mountain or the, or the mine is very different, the muon flux is different in different labs, meaning you won't get that cancellation anywhere else. So, for example, a homestake, homestake is much deeper than Grand Sasso, it's like a kilometre deeper. So the muons have had to go for another kilometre, which means that the muon flux is an order of magnitude lower. So the neutrinos, however, will be unaffected, so somewhere like homestake, you expect almost all of the signal to come from neutrino neutrons, which means the phase would be around January the 1st. So if an experiment in homestake observed an annual modulation of 9 sigma, if its phase peaked around January the 1st, that's good. But if its phase peaked at the same point as, uh, as Dharma, that would strongly imply maybe a dark matter explanation. So again, other labs really constrain that. Again, places like Sudan, where the muon flux is larger, would give you a phase much closer to the muons. So any other observation at a different lab will completely constrain the model. Um, so example experiments like KIMS, DMI, uh, ANACE, and SABRE, variety of experiments trying to test the Dharma hypothesis uh, they will all see different phases because a uh, DMI is in Antarctica, for example, so that will even the muon phase will be shifted because it's in the southern hemisphere. So any other observation would pretty much completely constrain the model. Uh, so you can get away with it fitting Dharma, but you can't fit anything else with the same uh, with the same free range. Um, so other experiments, are useful. Uh, so that's the summary of, of, of the Dharma idea. I'll go quickly onto cosmic after this. Um, very quickly. Uh, so, Dharma observed in annual modulation. Dark matter might be intentional with other experiments. And you can, in fact, fit it with neutrons from muons and neutrinos. And you can see here that the fit is actually pretty good. So, its cancellation between the two very neatly fits the Dharma data. Um, very briefly, I'll just talk about cogent. So, uh, cogent are also an experiment claiming to have seen dark matter. Um, they have a region which is sort of quite close to the Dharma, and again, uh, is intentional with other experiments. Um, so cogent is just one of these things here. It's like a little module uh, in a mine. Again, in a mine behind loads of shielding, not held in someone's hand. But it's, it's, a, it's a semiconductor module. So dark matter should come in, create a small energy pulse, which you observe, and uh, you look for these energy pulses. Um, something important about cogent, though, is that they have, in principle, a surface and a bulk. Okay? 
So in this diagram, I show why it's important to consider the surface. Background events, especially low energy gamma radiation, really sort of clusters on the surface because it, it doesn't penetrate for a far end of the sector. So it gets there, it gets stuck on the surface. So if you can separate the surface from the bulk in some way, that's a great way of, of separating dark matter from background because you expect essentially all of your surface events to be background. So if you can get rid of the surface, you're really getting ready of a lot of background. Whereas the bulk of the detector, that could be background, but it could also be dark matter. But you know if you get rid of the surface, that's, that's all background. Um, so you want to remove the surface events. And this is really what Cogent has had trouble with, surface events. They're all background. Um, the surface events tend to have lower energies because of how the surface of the Cogent detector work. And there's one other thing they have. Um, so this is the Cogent data. And it shows you, you can see why cogent might be cons consistent with, with light dark matter. It's the same, maybe the same idea as before. You have a rise at low energy, especially, especially here. So this is the, the cogent data as a function of energy, just a histogram. And you can see it rises at low energy. And that's also what you expect from a light dark matter candidate, it rises at low energy. So you can imagine maybe there's a dark matter candidate peaking above the background here. I mean, it's not that simplistic, but that's the idea. Right? You have a low energy rise, and that's what you're looking for. But you have to take a closer look, of course. Um, so this is what cogent actually measure. You can see that they have a sort of a pulse of energy. So when an event occurs, it occurs with a sort of voltage change, which gives you the gives you the energy of the event. So a large change gives you a high energy event, a small change gives you a low energy event. But you can also see that the pulse has some duration in microseconds. So you measure not only the duration of the pulse, but also its energy. So you have a pulse with an energy and a duration. We call this duration, or they call the duration, the rise time. Um, so why would the rise time be interesting? Well, the reason is because it discriminates surface and bulk events. And you can see that here. So you have, if you plot a histogram of the rise time for two different energy bins, for example, you can see, indeed, that there are two populations of events in terms of this rise time. There's a set of very fast events, which are the bulk events, and a set of very slow events, which are the surface events. So, as Cogent himself pointed out, you can use the rise time to separate bulk from surface. And as I just told you, surface are all background. So, you want to remove the surface event because you know they're going to be background events. And it's, it's already quite dangerous because I said that the low energy is the important bit for dark matter. And you can see actually there's loads and loads of surface events which are all background. So, you really want to get rid of those if you're going to look for dark matter. You want to keep the bulk events and remove the surface events. Um, so the only way of doing that is, is really statistically. So you have to fit these, these log normal distributions. Um, and you can work out from fitting these two distributions the fraction of bulk events as a function of energy. So you can see as a function of energy that the fraction of bulk events is roughly constant at high energy, but drops to about 25% at low energy. So bulk events, again, are really where we're looking to find dark. And you can see with energy that as you go to low energy, the fraction becomes lower which conversely means that the surface events are getting more numerous at low energy, uh, which is bad. Um, so, but it's quite easy to subtract them. You just take your pure spectrum of surface and bulk events, you multiply it by the fraction which are bulk, and that gives you only bulk events. So you take all your events, multiply it by the bulk fraction, which is like 25%, 20% at low energy, and that gives you only bulk events. And you can see that the low energy rise is pretty much gone, it's just a sort of flat spectrum of a peak, which peak is the L-shell peak, which you can remove. That's the basic idea. The difficulty is you don't know that function very well. So here, for example, I show the data. So this is the, the bulk fraction data, the two functions which represent, which might represent that data. You can see for the first, like, these are cubic splines. So for the first line, you can see that, in fact, there's actually no excess over background. These are background events in the bulk. But for the second spline, there is an excess. So what matters is that, actually, you can get an excess by just using the wrong from bulk fraction. So you really have to get the bulk fraction correct, otherwise you get an excess of events, which looks like dark matter. Um, so it's very dangerous. You can see here that if you use spline 1 for the bulk fraction, you get no excess, and you get no preference for dark matter at any cross-section, which I show here in the cross-section. But if you use the second spline, which, which tells you you have a big excess of events at low energy, you get 2.5 sigma events for dark matter. So it really matters which bulk fraction you use. Um, I'll jump straight to the point, essentially. Uh, so you have to marginalize over all of the different bulk fractions. So if you have the data for the fraction of bulk events, you have lots of different functions. 
The point is for some functions, like the blue line, you get no excess and therefore no best fit point. But for things like the red or the mauve line, you're starting to get a very large excess and therefore preference for dark matter. So you really have to marginalize over this choice, otherwise you end up in trouble. And when you do marginalize, you get less than one sigma evidence for dark matter, which is sort of in contrast to what Cogent used to say. What is the meaning of marginalizing? Now in this case, uh, sorry, yeah, I'm trying to be fast. It means that you, you consider all, poss all possible choices, in this case, of your function for the bulk fraction. So you consider, in, in, of course, practically you don't consider every choice, but you just consider a lot of them. You work out uh, how well dark matter fits the data for every choice of the bulk fraction. Chi-squared. Yeah, a chi-squared. You work out the chi-squared for every one, and then effectively, well, you, you work out the likelihood, which is e to the minus chi-squared of two. And then you sum those up for every bulk fraction with a prior. And that sort of almost, if you have a large error bar in your bulk fraction, it washes out the chi-squares to give you a positive. And it sort of, well, it factors in your uncertainty on the bulk fraction. So it's almost like you sum over all the line of um, uh, but the question is, uh, sorry I haven't had more time for this, but the point is, is that uh, this is why Cogen used to get a region. Um, the reason is because they have this fraction of bulk events in their old data. You can see, especially here, they don't really know the bulk events at all. And they fit this one parameter exponential to their data, see, which you can see here. Um, and in fact, that's what gave you the Cogent region. So they just used this exponential function. They didn't really have a reason to. It just sort of looks like the data. Um, what you can see actually is that using that exponential is the thing that gives you the extent. So if you use their exponential, which is this dashed move line, uh, you get exactly the excess they used to claim existed in their data back. So uh, this means that what you're doing is you're underestimating the number of surface events. So you're saying you're misidentifying surface events as bulk events. So here, because you're doing that, you have this huge rise of what you're saying of bulk events, much larger than the background you expect, which gives you a fit that looks like dark matter. But actually, there's no reason to use that function. You could also use uh, any other function that fits the data. Uh, this one works just as well. It's just as well motivated, but gives you no low energy excess. So the point here is, is that actually, the reason why they used to get uh, a region is because they, it was like a bias of the analysis. You have this one function, whereas in fact, you should have chosen all possible functions you could think of. And that's what marginalizing is, using everything. Uh, and that's where the excess came from. So to conclude, this is running out of time. Uh, there are explanations for a lot of these excesses in terms of other things. So dharma might be dark matter, but can potentially be explained without dark matter in terms of neutrons from muons and neutrinos. Uh, Cogent, there is actually no excess, it was never really there. It was just surface events that were misidentified as bulk events. Uh, and even now, uh, Crest 2, we have released new data, this is even from the Crest 2 planet, where they exclude their old region. Crest 2 was another experiment that might have said to found dark matter. Uh, you can explain that with something called surface roughness. It's quite similar to the surface events from Cosmic. So maybe we're looking at all these large diametric excesses actually going away, although perhaps it's too early to tell. But um, that's the basic idea, so I'll just leave the conclusions up. So. So what about cdm and silicon? Mm, the one last three Ooh, events. So three mysterious, events. yeah. I don't know. Yeah, three events yeah. Um, and three nuclear recoil events as well. Yeah, yeah. It's very mysterious, especially since they're excluded by super CDMS. Yeah, right. So, like, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. I can't explain it. It seems it's very difficult to analyze. Like, I mean, you look at their papers, figures of merit, all this stuff. So, in some sense, it's quite difficult. I don't know. There's no explanation I can think of. Maybe there's one internal, but. I mean, it's excluded by super CDMS, so it's difficult to think of a dark matter reason for CDMS SI. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's the one left. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? So, okay. So, what we'll next? Why? Well, I, I have to work out the. I, I, want, I want to find someone to do a Monte Carlo with me. So, I can do the. Uh, work out the neutrons from Dharma properly, really get the spectrum. Make sure, work out really, can the rates be larger? Do you get the cancellation? Does it really work? So I've done order of magnitude thing, which show, yeah, maybe it does. It's possible, but I want to really show that it does work. I want to be, maybe I'll show it doesn't. Um, but yeah, that's the next step, really precise calculations. Is it possible? I think it's possible. But is it in the collaboration, for example, already? Have any, any I can't data? find it. No, no, because you cannot find it in the same. Yeah.
They must. They should be able to. They've probably done some for the new ones. Yeah. Um, but you know, this should be deep. Yeah, I can speak to someone about it. Um, yeah, for the neutrinos it's less obvious. For the muons, there are lots of Monte Carlo, which really gives you it gives you that spectrum that rises and emerges. And you expect that the, really when you want to look at this a spectrum as well for the neutrino neutrons, you want to see that that also gives you the same form. Um, and really there's enough neutrons for neutrinos. That's really the thing. So but you in your mind there is no down. I don't know. I don't. I don't want to. I mean, no, no, it's not, but that, that I'm asking you. Right? Well, uh, I, you so I, I, I want a subjective answer. I don't know. Well, I think one. Political one is easy to give. I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure. It seems difficult to believe dark matter for dark, considering the null results from Lux and super It's it's difficult to consult. Um, I, I mean, I don't. Having written this paper, I don't actually want to take a stance because it's nice to be objective. Hey. I mean, CDMS, okay, uh, they reject the, the neutron uh, scatterings, right? I mean, they, they, they have a way to distinguish actually which events are due to neutrons. I think, I don't think that's perfectly efficient. I think they can sometimes. Okay, but, but, so, but this is the question actually. Can you use the rejected actually? I mean, I don't know if, they, if yeah, these yeah. data are actually available, but I mean, yeah. if you're able to know, I mean, what are the rejected events, then maybe. Yes, directly you can figure out like uh, yeah. how many neutrons are produced. Right? Or, or yeah. even if you could look for a modulation in their rejected events, uh -huh. if they yeah, reject exactly. thousands of neutrons, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, it'd be good if you could get yeah more data from experimental collaborations, even like the the ones that Lux removes by volume, by neutralization, all that sort of stuff exactly. on the outside. Yeah. Yeah. You can really get those events. Maybe there's a modulation in there. That will be very interesting. That's true. So if you man manage to get these amplitudes for the, the, the neutrino and the neutrons. From, from the other measurements and computers and things, then could you, in principle, like for instance, find that you get the right phase, but the, am the amplitude is kind of smaller than the yeah, other signal, and then you say, yeah, there's still dark matter, but it's. Yeah, well, I, mean, I guess that's true. Yeah, I suppose if you got half of it completely accurately, then that's half dark matter, half the transfer Yeah, Yeah, I yeah, know, yeah, it's true. If you, if you knew well enough. But it's difficult. I mean, the, the error bars on Dharma are still quite large, so it's, it'd be amazing that you could get it to that precision. Um, yeah, and, then, and then the other run, actually, if, unless you actually do compute uh, these, uh, these amplitude coefficients in such a way that you can also do this for other experiments, mm -hmm. what you were saying earlier, then if you fit this here, it wouldn't, it wouldn't kind of already tell you what, what you said in another experiment, it's not quite true in the sense mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you still have, in another experiment, the, the setup would be different. So sure. This scattering kind of volume and all this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Absolutely. you can't, you can't actually uh, say. You can sort of do it. Like if, if you know the muon flux is like 100 times larger than it is right. a grand sensor, you could argue that maybe it didn't matter too much what the geometry was because there's a hundred times more muons. But yes, that's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I showed up a lot of different labs, that's a sort of like saying if Dharma were in a different place. It's yeah. not like saying if there were another experiment in a different lab because that's completely dependent on the experiment, the set up. Yeah, perfectly true. And you have to ask the questions of why things like Kim's don't observe an modulation. Um, yeah. And that might be due to things like the set up. I just want to say a couple of words. Uh, you probably, some of, some of you have seen Jonathan before here, right? No. He was here, he was here for a graduate school. Jonathan, Jonathan I mean, just a few words. Uh, as you know, we have a CP3 lectures reserved for senior scientists. A senior scientist is defined by somebody that makes an impact, not necessarily by seniority. Uh, 